Thank you so much for joining our book talk today featuring San Francisco's Chinatown by Dick Evans and Kathy Chin Leong. My name is Akemi Chani Mai and I'm the program manager at Oakland Asian Cultural Center. OACC's mission is to build vibrant communities through API arts and cultural programs that foster intergenerational and cross-cultural dialogue, understanding, collaboration, and social justice. And it is my great pleasure to be able to present this event with Heyday Books, uh, which is an independent nonprofit publisher based in Berkeley. Um, and you can find out more about them at heydaybooks.com. Um, so I will post some links so you can access more information in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I also did want to encourage everyone to utilize the chat uh, for any comments. You know, if you're hearing information that's really interesting, um, if you wanted to pose any questions uh, for Dick and Kathy to respond to afterwards, uh, feel free to also use either the chat or the Q&A function in uh, the menu. Um, we are also simultaneously streaming and recording this uh, session on our YouTube channel. So if you have other friends that you would love to share tonight's event with, um, that recording will be made available afterwards. So without further ado, um, that concludes my introduction. And actually before we transition to uh, Kathy and Dick for their presentation, we wanted to first give you a nice trailer. Uh, it's about a two minute trailer um, just to set up the context and the feel for this book. So please enjoy. All right, thank you. And I hope I hope that trailer helped to set up and whet your appetite for what is to come. Um, it's just a wonderful preview. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dick Evans and Kathy Chin Leong. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Akimi. And thank you to the Oakland Asian Cultural Center uh, for sponsoring this. And thank you uh, to all of you for joining us and attending. Um, so now that you've seen the trailer, the short version, uh, Kathy and I would like to go into a little more detail on some of the images and some of the stories uh, that are behind the book. So starting with this first image, uh, it's a very uh, classic uh, image of what we think of as Chinatown today. Uh, this is Grant Avenue, uh, which is the, uh, the street that runs right through the center of Chinatown. That's where most of the tourist shops and uh, many restaurants and uh, all kinds of activities. And you can see the red lanterns, you can see the signs, you can see the 
uh, architecture. Uh, and this, again, is I think what we think of. Uh, I know probably most of you are from the Bay Area and have probably been there and visited Chinatown. So you know exactly uh, what it looks like and this looks familiar to you. Uh, it's not a uh, coincidence at all that we chose uh, a, a street scene from Grant Avenue of one of the facades of uh, one of the buildings there to be the cover of the book uh, because it so represents uh, what we think of as Chinatown. Uh, this is, is quite a historic building. It used to house the Four Seas restaurant, which was a very well-known restaurant. Uh, in fact, they kept the sign, even though the restaurant's been cl closed for a number of years. Uh, so it still says Four Seas on the sign. Uh, however, now inside of this building, uh, you have Chinatown's uh, one uh, Michelin-starred restaurant, a very contemporary upscale uh, restaurant named Mr. Jews, uh, and a great place to uh, eat. Uh, Kathy and I were just there uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually meeting someone uh, in regard to the book. Uh, here's another street scene. Uh, you get the picture of the pagoda rooftops uh, and the historical uh, street lamps here. Uh, and these last few pictures, uh, we, we often call historical Chinatown, uh, but it's not the original Chinatown. That's an important difference, I think. Uh, if you go back to when Chinatown was founded, and that was in the mid 1800s, so beginning in about 1850, uh, it was founded during the gold rush and then uh, the building of the railroads. Uh, and it, it, there were thousands of Southern Chinese immigrants who came flooding into California, uh, mostly through the Bay Area uh, to work in the gold mines or to work in the uh, railroads or to stay in San Francisco and uh, provide services that were very much in uh, demand at that time. Um, but the original Chinatown did not look like this at all. Uh, it in fact was a nondescript, low rise uh, housing, uh, crowded, uh, unsanitary, really what you would call a ghetto, uh, I think. And um, that was the case until uh, the turn of the century. And then, uh, you know, if, if all of you are from the Bay Area, you know there was a major seismic event, literally a seismic event in 1906. Uh, which really changed uh, San Francisco and other parts of the Bay Area. And that, of course, was the great earthquake of 1906. And then the fires uh, that took place after that. Uh, so this area in downtown San Francisco that had been a shanty town uh, and had been Chinatown uh, was uh, destroyed through a combination of the earthquake and uh, then the fires. And there were uh, very few structures that survived. And none that survived totally intact. Uh, so there was a, a question after that as to what to do with this area. Uh, and the city leaders at the time uh, thought they saw an opportunity to maybe move the Chinese immigrant residents out of this prime real estate right in the center of the city, uh, out to Hunter's Point or other uh, far reaches of uh, San Francisco. But the residents were not having any of that and they banded together and, uh, and made a convincing argument uh, apparently because it succeeded. Uh, to have the uh, area rebuilt, but rebuilt as a tourist attraction as well as a residential area. Uh, so that's where this uh, quote, oriental architecture comes from uh, because it was agreed that it would be built in some of these elaborate pagoda structures uh, and the uh, classical street lamps and uh, in a way that would uh, be a, a picture of what China itself might look like and therefore it would be uh, a tourist attraction, which it turned out to be. And in fact, uh, you could call it an experiment, I guess, that worked quite successfully over the decades and it has become uh, one of the biggest tourist attractions, certainly in San Francisco, bigger than the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, in fact, on uh, normal years. Uh, now, when uh, the Chinese immigrants came, 
uh, particularly up to and through the earthquake period. Uh, of course, it was not an easy immigration. They were uh, discriminated against. They were restricted as to where they could work. They were restricted as to who they could bring. For example, uh, they could not bring uh, wives. They could not bring uh, unmarried women. Uh, so it was a, a difficult immigration. Uh, and you may have heard there was a, a law passed in 1882 called the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act. So very specific. Uh, and it makes, uh, you know, it reminds us of, of some of the immigrant immigration issues we're facing today, but really it was much more overt uh, and uh, power, more powerful in a way than all the talk about the Mexican wall today. Uh, so it was uh, difficult to immigrate. Uh, you had to be registered. Uh, some people were turned back. Uh, many figured out, uh, even through uh, adopting alternative names, uh, to get approved and get in, uh, partly because many of the records had been destroyed during the earthquake and the fires. Uh, so here you see a picture of a registration card from uh, the Chinese Historical Society Museum, which is in Chinatown. Uh, now, another uh, interesting fact is once Angel Island became the entry point, uh, so it was like the Ellis Island of the West Coast, uh, the Chinese immigrants, in fact, all the West Coast immigrants went through there. And when they were, were uh, stuck there, uh, basically quarantined indefinitely until they could get approval uh, to come into the country, uh, they would carve inscriptions on the walls and on the bunk beds and other uh, wood structures uh, saying different things. And let me just read this one to you because it's, I think, very moving. Everybody's got a number. I think my number is 80340. They would put your number on the blackboard and you know that you have to go to interrogation or a health checkup. They didn't use names. On the day they let you go, your number is on the blackboard and it says San Francisco. And if you see down at the bottom, that was carved in the wall by a young man, 11 years old at the time. And that was as late as 1939. Uh, now the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was removed after a few decades, but then other more informal, but equally powerful restrictions uh, really were not lifted until about the 1950s. Uh, so this went on for the first century of uh, what is now Chinatown. But the history of Chinatown uh, is not only that first hundred years. Uh, there's more contemporary history that's also quite interesting uh, and focuses on some issues of social justice as well. Uh, there are two statues in uh, Chinatown that are uh, quite impressive and quite interesting. This is one, uh, if any of you remember seeing film clips, either live or, or recorded clips of the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989, you may recognize this figure. Uh, it was a statue made out of wood, cardboard, and paper uh, that the students had built in Tiananmen Square. And uh, this is a tribute to that uprising uh, it's made out of bronze, and it was done in the last couple of decades and is in the center of Portsmouth Square, which is the heart of Chinatown uh, and uh, where everybody assembles in uh, Chinatown for card games and other activities. The second uh, very significant statue is this one uh, in St. Mary's Square, uh, right uh, next to the Bank of America building which you see in the background there, that's the B of A building. Um, but this is the Comfort Women's uh, statue and it is a tribute to the young women and girls uh, who were taken hostage basically and forced into sex slavery for uh, Japanese soldiers during World War II. Uh, and of course that's well known and, and uh, uh, but this is a, uh, uh, a statue that was done only about a decade ago 
uh, as a tribute to the young women. And you see a Chinese uh, woman here, the other two, one is Korean and one is uh, Filipino. So as you look back at the history of Chinatown, you'll see that there are many periods in which uh, it was a very difficult time and it took considerable resilience for Chinatown to survive the 170 years that it has and maintain its character and its culture. So it's always been a bit of a history of resilience, survival, but also celebration, which we'll talk about too. In uh, working uh, together uh, with me, Kathy Chin Leong interviewed over 100 residents, businesses, and friends of Chinatown. Uh, so let me turn it over to Kathy to tell some of the stories that she uncovered through those interviews. Kathy? Yes. Well, in this mural, which is one of my favorites because you can see it's right behind me, um, it's five feet high and nearly 18 feet long. It was created by the artist James Leong and it covers 100 years of Chinese in America. Um, a lot of people were really up in arms, especially the Chinese community when they saw this mural being posted because they felt it reinforced Chinese stereotypes even though it was historically accurate. And the rejection hurt the artist so much that he left America altogether and has spent the remaining of his career in Europe. Well, fortunately, um, after this, after these panels, these seven panels had disappeared, uh, the Chinese Historical Society of America found them again. Some of them um, were being used as a ping pong table, the rest stacked up in this Chinese recreation center. Now they were restored and um, James Leon was brought back to uh, retouch the paintings. And um, now we have it back. And so we're so happy uh, to be able to see it at the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum in Chinatown. On the left is this woman named Su Li, and she's an expert in Chinese American history. And what is the significance here, you ask? Here you see um, one watercolor in a set of 12. They're extremely rare watercolors by the late artist, Jake Lee. Now the original works once hung in the elegant Khan's restaurant in Chinatown. And after Khan's was sold in the 1990s, the paintings mysteriously disappeared until Sue hunted them down and brought them back together. So, uh with a common history uh, that Chinatown has had, as you would expect, there's uh, quite a strong culture there. Uh, and the strong, the biggest event, cultural event of the year is, is clearly the Lunar New Year celebration, as it is in Asia, of course, for those of you who are familiar with there. Uh, and it has different names in different Asian countries, but the celebration is the same time and essentially uh, similar. Uh, so here you have uh, a photo of the Chinese parade. Uh, it's a mile long. Uh, it attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors, uh, except unfortunately, probably not this year because of the pandemic crisis. But when it does uh, start up again, it's certainly something that's worth going to see and taking your family and, or just by yourself to enjoy it. Uh, very colorful, um, very elaborate, uh, a lot of music, a lot of dragons, a lot of lions, a lot of floats, a lot of firecrackers. You've never seen so many firecrackers. Uh, and it also has uh, some student groups uh, in various costumes, uh, everything from marching bands to stilt walkers. And here's uh, two young elementary uh, age students, uh, obviously more like seventh or eighth grade, uh, but uh, from West Portal Elementary in San Francisco. Uh, and each year West Portal uh, participates through a troupe of stilt walkers in costume. Uh, and this is a young woman. She's also a stilt walker. Uh, and as you can see is also in costume. During the new year uh, celebration, of course the year of the Zodiac is important. And in 2019, that happened to be uh, the year of the pig. 
Uh, so the second biggest is the Moon Festival, which takes place in the fall and just took place uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, here you have a picture of the moon goddess and her god. Uh, the woman on the left is a woman we worked with actually uh, on the book. Uh, her name is Maggie Wong and she's a TV uh, journalist, personality, has had a, a TV show in Chinese for uh, a number of years. Uh, and she's been, she's played the role of the moon goddess for about the last 20 years although she did tell me she's planning to retire uh, next year. So maybe there'll be someone else, but uh, she was very helpful to us uh, as we started the project in terms of making introductions for us, um, getting us behind the scenes, making recommendations, uh, and also uh, being fluent in Chinese. Uh, of course, she was able to uh, communicate effectively uh, in some cases with shop owners and others who uh, did not speak much English at all. Now today, if Bruce Lee were alive, he would be 80 years old. Before he came on the scene in the late 1960s and 1970s, Chinese males had no role models in the media. Chinese were cast as houseboys or evil emperors, or white people who played lead Chinese roles had taped eyes and spoke broken English in stereotypic accents. Bruce Lee changed the life of this man on the left, Jeff Chin. When Jeff was a boy growing up in Daly City, he was picked on because he was Chinese. Then one night after a very difficult day at school, he was in bed and he was looking at the Bruce Lee poster hanging on his wall. And he sensed that Bruce Lee off the poster was reaching out to him, telling him everything would be okay. After that day, everything changed for him. He vowed that he would make Bruce Lee proud one day. And here he is today, the top world's foremost collector of Bruce Lee memorabilia. His collection is so famous, it's traveled all around the world, including the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Now we're here at Skylon Memorial Park. It is the Ritz Carlton of cemeteries in San Mateo. And every spring, Taoist priests and families come by the busload during Qingming, and, uh, a holiday to honor dead ancestors. Dick and I got a tour of the manicured premises with amazing vistas. What a contrast. In the 1800s, Chinese could not be buried in the same cemeteries as whites, and they were pushed um, outside of San Francisco for burial. Another tradition in Chinatown and in Chinese culture is martial arts, of course, and uh, one of those is Tai Chi, uh, although today we think of it more as uh, exercise in the park, uh, because that's where you most often see it taking place. Uh, and as we were uh, doing this project, we learned that there's actually an international Tai Chi day. Uh, and luckily we learned that a couple weeks before it occurred. Uh, so we thought it would be uh, a good idea if we could get some people to come take a Tai Chi class uh, and enjoy some refreshments that we supplied. Uh, so we offered through the Chinese Culture Center, anyone that would come on International Tai Chi Day, we would have free tea and pastries and uh, that we would have a free class, Tai Chi class on the bridge over Kearney Street. So that's what you saw in that uh, past picture. Uh, we also fortunately uh, just uh, luckily uh, found a Tai Chi master, this woman here, Xu Fen Xiao, uh, who is uh, the wife of an herbalist. And we were there taking photos and interviewing the herbalist and saw a number of very large trophies on top of his herb cabinets. Uh, so we were curious and asked about those. And he said, oh, those aren't mine or anyone we sponsored, those are my wife's. Uh, and so she was working in the back room and he called her out and we started chatting with her and found out that she'd been a Tai Chi master for some time, uh, done a lot of performances, competitions, uh, performed in a lot of events. Uh, so we couldn't resist asking if she could come back when we had time uh, to walk around Chinatown with her 
and have her strike some poses uh, like in front of uh, iconic buildings or landmarks or uh, in this case, uh, a, a dragon mural. Uh, so we got dozens of really great photos of her in all different kinds of poses. Uh, we, we did not expect the uh, pink Tai Chi outfit, I have to say. We saw her wearing all black and we sort of suspected that's the way she would come. So when she came in with the pink silk Tai Chi outfit, we were thrilled and it really worked well in the photo shoots. I agree. Here we're with Ron Tong. He's seated in the front on the left. We are at a red egg and ginger party. And this is a um, traditional baby party. The baby is one month coming out party. Baby Rose is in the center. Um, at a red egg and ginger party, you have dyed red eggs to celebrate and represent fertility and a plate of ginger which represents energy and strength. And here's another custom red envelopes. I think it's the kids who love Chinese New Year the most. You typically give a pair of red envelopes filled with two fresh bills. Why two? It represents double happiness. Now, when a girl grows up, traditionally, um, after she gets engaged, the bride-to-be will order a custom tailored Chang Sam to wear for the wedding. Meanwhile, the wedding tea ceremony is a treasured tradition, but fewer couples are honoring it. However, Liana and Michael are the exception. On their knees, they present tea to their elders, and in turn, the parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, will offer them jewelry and money. Now, brides aren't the only ones who get jewelry. Many times, an older woman will start handing down her heirlooms to her daughter, granddaughter, or daughter-in-law when she feels the time is right. Now in ancient times, people believed if you wore a gold necklace or a jade bracelet, you would be protected from evil spirits. So Chinese jewelry is unique in this way because not only is it ornamental, many believed at that time it possessed powers and it's also been used during war uh, for money and barter. Now, I love this picture because it depicts everyday Chinatown life. Unfortunately, this mural is no longer there. But in this picture, a modern woman passes a traditional tailor shop and she's wearing a traditional jade bracelet, probably from her mother or grandmother. And she's carrying a bag of good luck oranges and a box of bakery treats for a sweet life. Now, this is my family sharing dim sum on a Saturday morning. It's otherwise known as going to yum cha. And that's a common memory for American born Chinese like myself. Little plates of chicken feet and steamed tripe and gizzards are not exotic, but everyday dishes. And we hope that you will post some of your favorite foods on the chat screen below. Well, Chinatown has a very strong sense of community. It's, it's something that I suspected before doing the project and certainly confirmed uh, doing the project. And you get that sense of community if you ever take a walk through Portsmouth Square. Uh, and for those who have visited Chinatown, I'm sure you've done that. Uh, and you'll see uh, groups of women, men, some mixed groups uh, playing cards, mahjong, Chinese checkers, Chinese chess, uh, all out in, in Portsmouth Square in the sun. Uh, the day I took this picture, it was nice and bright and sunny, but then the clouds came around and it just uh, broke out and started pouring. And I assumed everybody was going to, you know, stop the card games and go home, but not at all. Uh, they didn't even fold their hands. They just kept their hands uh, and they uh, took out their umbrellas. They moved over under the Kearney uh, Street Bridge gate. Uh, and continued as if nothing had ever happened. Um, but walking through Portsmouth Square is a great way to get a feel uh, for the sense of community there. Uh, also on a Saturday morning, if you were to go inside some of the benevolent family benevolent associations, and of course they're private uh, organizations, so we needed to get a contact and, and get invited in. Um, but here you, say, you see men playing a game 
uh, you see groups of women and, and mixed groups playing, again, cards, mahjong, uh, and other games. Another tradition in Chinatown is the Miss Chinatown USA pageant. And uh, so we thought that it would be fun to meet Miss Chinatown, learn something about her, learn something about the history of the pageant. Uh, so here she is for 2019. This is Catherine Wu. And uh, Miss Chinatown is selected not just on her beauty and poise and talent, but also on her commitment to the community uh, such as you see here where she is uh, at a bilingual school uh, and she did reading in uh, both Chinese and in English uh, and encouraging the students to be good students. Uh, and she did that regularly during her, uh, her reign and uh, commitment as Miss Chinatown. But we also found something very unexpected and that was that she was a world-class athlete and archer as you see here. Uh, and she was in fact uh, hoping and was a serious candidate to be on the Olympic team for 2019. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, the Olympics were canceled and uh, I, I don't think she has plans to try to do it again uh, in 2021 uh, because uh, she's gone off to college now studying biomedical engineering. <laughs> and is uh, a top-notch student. But it was really interesting to learn about her archery skills and to be able to uh, take some photos of her in that role as well as other roles. Uh, now, you may ask, why is there a separate Miss Chinatown USA contest? And the reason is that uh, Chinese women and young uh, girls were discouraged from participating or prohibited from participating for decades. Uh, in the regular Miss America, Miss California, and other uh, pageants of that nature. Uh, so they formed their own pageant. And then, of course, that's changed in the last couple of decades. Uh, but they kept the tradition, which uh, I think is great, because as you can see, uh, someone like Catherine really embodies, uh, you know, the strength, the character uh, that you'd like to see and sets a role model example for uh, young women growing up in uh, Chinatown and elsewhere for that matter. Uh, a similar reason uh, is behind the existence of the Chinatown YMCA. Uh, previously, uh, Chinese were not welcomed or allowed in YMCAs around the city. Uh, so naturally they took it upon themselves to uh, create their own YMCA with the support of the YMCA. Uh, so that's why you have uh, this very nice facility and, and very nice organization in Chinatown today and well used. Uh, and a, a third example of the same discrimination and uh, why Chinatown had to be so self-reliant, this is the hospital. This is actually the donor wall where you see those that contributed to the recent rebuilding into a very modern, uh, very nice hospital in Chinatown. Uh, and the reason again goes back to uh, Chinese immigrants were not welcome or were uh, turned away from hospitals in San Francisco. Uh, so felt they needed their own. And in, in addition, they wanted a hospital which could also incorporate uh, some of the herbal medicines that, uh, that you traditionally have as well as Western medicine uh, in their culture. Now today, Chinatown is the densest neighborhood outside of Manhattan. It's only one fifth of a square mile and houses anywhere um, between 25 to 30,000 people, according to um, Francisco records. So imagine your home is the size of a closet and it's shared with four or more people. Welcome to single renter occupancy or SRO apartments. Here with no access to washers or dryers, you have to hand wash and hang dry your laundry and you have to share a restroom and kitchen with all your neighbors. Now, one of the Chinatown heroes is Reverend Norman Fong. He's the former executive director of the Chinatown Community Development Center. 
And on the day of this photo, a young lady who lived in the SRO building ran up to him and asked if he could visit her grandmother. And of course he said, yes. It turned out the grandmother was too sick to walk down the stairs because there are no elevators in SROs. And so with much compassion and tenderness, he took both her hands in his and whispered a prayer to her in Chinese. Today, if you're on the Dragon Boat Racing Team from the nonprofit Community Youth Center, all your gear and all your practice time and all your, um, your clothing is all free of charge. Thanks to CYC, the sport is transforming the lives of at-risk kids who might be tempted to join the wrong crowd. Bella Chen says she was very unathletic before joining the team and she's gotten so good now she's the team captain. Today, many Chinese kids are proud of their heritage. Yuhan Chen, only six at the time this was taken, she picks up a brush for the first time at this Chinese New Year event, and she finds out she excels at Chinese calligraphy. Meanwhile, Tyler Pham samples dragon beard candy, making a beard of his own. Dragon beard was originally the dessert of ancient Chinese emperors made from a solid block of syrup and hand pulled to form thousands of strands. You see these colorful buildings? They belong to family associations and there are more than 200 of them in Chinatown. Now back in the 1800s, if you landed in Chinatown, you would look up your association based on your village or the last name. And the association would help you secure a job and a place to stay. So they were quite essential. Many of these association rooms feature shrines. And note that these are private clubhouses, as Dick mentioned earlier. They're not open to outsiders. Getting in to take pictures for a book is extremely rare and you must get permission. Now a play called King of the Yees about family associations came to San Francisco last year. And the comedy was written by Lauren Yi. She grew up in Chinatown and spent many years attending Chinese association functions herself. Now the largest of these family associations is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. It consists of more than 50,000 members all over the US and Canada. Recently, they worked with officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. But the largest problem facing today is future leadership. Now, as you can see, these are all older men and most sons are not involved. Further, women are not allowed to um, have leadership. So that's a big problem there. This is Cecilia Chang, who recently passed away at 100 years old. She was very famous restaurateur and she was considered the Julia Child of Chinese cooking. Back in 1968, she opened the very first elegant and successful Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin. And it was based in Ghirardelli Square in Fishman's Wharf, not in Chinatown. And the reason was this, the Chinese in Chinatown were Cantonese and she was not Cantonese, but from Shanghai. So also she was a woman. So they disqualified her from ever opening up shop. Her son, Philip, later on, many years later, caught the restaurant bug too. And he's a co-founder of P.F. Chang's. Now in the 1800s, going way back, Chinese schools were erected because parents feared their children would lose their culture and language. The youth learned Cantonese, the language of the Guangdong province, but now kids are learning Mandarin, the national language of China. Music and dance, of course, are another important aspect of Chinese culture and Chinatown's culture. Uh, and here you see uh, a young man setting up the props for the Chinese opera uh, in advance of one of their performances. Uh, but you see music and dance in the form of opera, in the form of burlesque, which I'll come to in a minute, and dragon dancing, of course, uh, among others. Uh, so the Chinese opera, as you can imagine, and you may have seen pictures, puts on very elaborately staged 
and costumed events. Uh, here you see uh, uh, the lead man in the opera uh, getting his final uh, uh, costuming uh, completed before the show. Uh, now, fortunately, uh, I was able to be invited backstage in the dressing room three hours before the show started because that's when they start putting on their makeup. And it's quite fascinating to, uh, to see how all that happens. Uh, so you have three hours of meticulously putting on uh, makeup and costume and more makeup and more costume. <laughs> Uh, and then the performance takes place and you really appreciate the performance when you've seen uh, the time and effort and uh, amount of detail that goes into getting ready for that. Another form of dance a bit different is burlesque. And there was a period in, uh, I guess it was about the 1950s, maybe into the 60s in Chinatown where burlesque was a very popular uh, entertainment uh, in the form of dance and singing. Uh, so uh, years later, after that uh, faded away, uh, recently a woman named Cynthia Yi organized some of these same dancers who were in their 20s when they were performing previously into a group called the Grant Avenue Follies and resurrected uh, these performances. Uh, so these are women who are now all in their 70s and 80s, uh, put on a spectacular show, uh, more than an hour up to an hour and a half with no break, uh, and very entertaining. They do a lot of events for nonprofits uh, or benefits like for the veterans, uh, for example. Uh, but I think uh, when you see them perform uh, and appreciate uh, their age and yet uh, how graceful and fluid and uh, well they perform. It's really a, a tribute to uh, the benefits of dance uh, throughout a lifetime. Removing a lion head to mimic a real lion is work. Each lion head weighs about 10 pounds at least. And if you haven't practiced, your arms won't last through an entire parade. This is Corey Chan and we nicknamed him the lion head whisperer. So for 40 years, he's been restoring injured lion heads and gives them back the roar. He's been simply self-taught. He replaces eyelid strings used for blinking. He glues on new fur and he paints over scratches until the lion head looks just like new. And after all the repairs, Corey says, new memories come back to the lion. Aren't these stunning? To many visitors and residents alike, I think, a Chinatown visit is not complete without a stop at a restaurant or a bakery or the food market. And I know that over the three year period that I worked on this book, I would seldom get out of Chinatown without making a dim sum stop or uh, a stop at the bakery to bring something home. Uh, there is in fact a best selling book uh, that's still in print called The Woman Who Ate Chinatown, a San Francisco odyssey. Uh, it was written by the late Shirley Fong Torres, uh, Ben Fong Torres's sister. Uh, many people have their favorite local establishment like this one would be. And typically you might see roasted ducks in the window as you see here. Uh, now roasted ducks are probably never going to disappear from uh, Chinese or Chinatown restaurants. Uh, but the venues have changed and are changing. This happens to be a picture from China Live, which is a, a new upscale, uh, very uh, uh, sort of different ambiance, very much like a Napa Valley ambiance restaurant, uh, you might expect. Here you see the kitchen of China Live uh, with the uh, you know, immaculate uh, stainless steel facilities. Here you see a, a giant uh, 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 steaming uh, cooker. And then my favorite, the giant chocolate mousse maker, mixer that this young girl is working on. Uh, there are a couple of these uh, new upscale restaurants. Uh, and I think I mentioned at the beginning um, in that building where the uh, cover uh, facade was taken. Uh, 
there's a restaurant named Mr. Jews, and the chef is a uh, emerging young star named Brandon Jew. Uh, and they serve uh, very modern, contemporary, delicious cuisine uh, at Mr. Jews, and it is a, a Michelin starred restaurant now. And there are also other uh, younger restaurateurs that are uh, coming into their own. This is uh, a young woman whose parents were also and still are uh, restaurant owners in Chinatown. She started her own restaurant called Fang Restaurant. Uh, her name's Kathy Fang. And she has won quite a number of awards for her cooking uh, and is one of the rising stars uh, in the restaurant sector in uh, Chinatown. From fancy restaurants to traditional delis, this happy employee works at Mo Li Xing Qi, a business of dried meats and poultry over 100 years old, spanning seven generations. And this is dried fish. Have you ever had dried salted fish or ham yi? I love it. When I stayed in my grandmother's studio apartment near Chinatown, my popo steamed this with rice for breakfast. Coffee crunch cake, anyone? This is Eastern Bakery, and it's only one of two bakeries making the famous confection in San Francisco. The other is in Japantown. Now on Stockton Street, known as the locals Chinatown, every day at 4 p.m., the little grandmas emerge from their SRO apartments for produce on sale. Yet man yet bao, that means $1, one bag. And there's one thing that unites Chinese, no matter what generation, no matter where you're from, we all love a good bargain. And here you see dried um, roots and fungi. What are these used for? These are ingredients in a healthy family soup recipe. Simply put, you take a fistful of this and a fingerful of that, soup will clear up your acne, it'll fortify your chi, it'll improve your circulation. And a traditional Cantonese mother will cook a soup every day for her family. But unfortunately, I am not a traditional Cantonese mother. Entrepreneurs and small family businesses are prevalent in Chinatown and in fact are the lifeblood of Chinatown's economy. Uh, and I think no one that we met is more entrepreneurial, harder working or determined uh, than the woman that you see here. This is Tang Chen, 82 years old, who founded, owns, and operates the walk shop on Grant Avenue. Uh, and even during the recent COVID shutdown, when I spoke with her, she was working six or seven days a week handling the online orders, uh, which has helped her keep her business going throughout the crisis. But the variety of businesses is uh, quite impressive. You have everything from uh, an herbalist that you see here, in fact, the husband of the Tai Chi master, uh, to a florist, studio photographer that you see here, acupuncturist. Uh, in fact, everything that a community needs to be self-sufficient, if you think about it. And then if you reflect back on my comments about uh, Miss Chinatown, the Y, the hospital, uh, Chinatown had to have everything it needed to be self-sufficient because for decades it was not allowed to access the services and the goods outside of Chinatown. Some businesses cater specifically to the tourist trade. Of course, they've been hit very hard with the COVID situation, uh, but the tea tasting, uh, lovely uh, boutiques where you can sample a variety of teas. Uh, you have other businesses like uh, jade carvings, uh, which is one that's been hit, I think, especially hard and also a bit by the internet because uh, more and more you can order these things, uh, the jewelry on the internet. And I think uh, this is a, a sector that may not come back as strong as it uh, was previously. But I hope, I hope there's some that survive because it is very colorful and it's great for shopping when you're just browsing through Chinatown. Uh, now, similar to the restaurant scene where I mentioned there are some new restaurants, some quite upscale uh, contemporary restaurants, you also see some new boutiques uh, emerging as well. 
This happens to be the gift shop at China Live, uh, the restaurant that I mentioned. There's quite a well-developed gift shop. Uh, this is the co-owner of China Live and the wife of the chef, George Chen. This is Cindy Chen. Uh, she spent uh, months going all around uh, China, Europe, other parts of Asia, uh, collecting and curating the things she wanted in her gift shop. Uh, and it's all, uh, you know, the best that she could find, best design, uh, most authentic uh, from many places around Asia and Europe. It's a, a lovely gift shop to uh, uh, browse in. Here's another new uh, upscale modern uh, clothing boutique in this case uh, called Kim Plus Ono. And it's a play on words for kimono. Uh, and it sells uh, hand painted silk uh, clothing uh, items. Uh, it was the venue for hosting the Moon Festival kickoff in 2019 when uh, I was taking photos there. Uh, and they had a Crazy Rich Asians theme night the night that they were kicking it off. So you, you can see the uh, young woman here and you see the type of thing they uh, they sell their beautiful uh, painted silk uh, kimonos, uh, nightgowns, and uh, other uh, clothing items. Finally, I'd like to close on this image, and then we'll be happy to get to your questions. Uh, this is uh, the, the photo that's on the back of uh, the book, the back cover, in fact. It's a mural uh, that we ran across in sort of a back hallway of one of the new restaurants called Dim Sum Corner. Uh, and while we were there photographing uh, the restaurant and uh, the kitchen of Dim Sum Corner, um, we saw this mural, we really loved it because uh, we think it really conveys uh, a lot about Chinatown today. Uh, so what you see here, of course, is a, a young, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, she just looks confident. Uh, a rare young woman uh, painted in this uh, graphic arts vibe uh, to make it even more contemporary, but holding a modern camera uh, and at the same time dressed in a very traditional red dress. So it sort of captures, uh, you know, an eye to tradition, an eye to the future, uh, and a contemporary, confident uh, young person looking forward into the future. So with that, we'll be delighted to take your questions. I see that there are at least four questions and a couple chat comments. Uh, Akimi, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the questions and if you'd like to prioritize them for us. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you. That was such an informative and beautiful presentation. Oh, my goodness. This, I think that it really elevates, you know, maybe scenes that we've we're very familiar with, um, you know, walking through some of these neighborhoods and they may be, you know, uh, I'm sure that a lot of people have fond memories personally um, of these neighborhoods, but it's just really great to see them um, uplifted in this beautiful publication. So thank you so much for the three years, three years of <laughs> dedication and, and love. You can really feel that from this, this book. Um, so while I, I, I see a couple questions in our Q and A, and I also wanted to encourage, you know, if any folks were having maybe a little trouble, or you would prefer to ask your question verbally, to both Kathy and Dick, um, please feel free to use. Uh, there's a raising your raising hand function, raise hand function. Um, I think you can access it uh, in the participant section or like next to your name. So if you raise your hand, I'll be able to see you and you can answer. But um, in the meantime, I thought I would just go down our, our list and try to get to as many as possible. So um, first uh, question about growing up, um, all of these are unfortunately anonymous, so I hope uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're here. Um, growing up in the 60s in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I recall the impact the film Flower Drum Song made on me and I'd be interested to know if you had any contact or photographed any residents who are part of any popular Hollywood films that were shot in Chinatown, for example, like Maggie Wong or... Right. Yeah, no, I think Maggie's probably a little too young to have been in uh, movies in the 60s, but uh, 
And I don't know if she's ever, I'm, I know she's been filmed numerous times in her TV broadcasting, but I don't know if she's ever been in any movies. So uh, short answer is no, we really didn't. I identify anyone who said I was in a movie. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Cecilia Chang uh, had to be uh, uh, maybe in a cameo in a movie or two. Uh, I think her restaurant was uh, because it was so, uh, so famous and, and prominent. Uh, and for sure, many movies have, have used some of the architecture and so on. But uh, I probably the closest we came was, uh, uh, you know, Bruce Lee, the Bruce Lee collector. Uh, uh, you know, there were multiple movies made by Bruce Lee or not that many actually less than 10. But um, we did run across some old Bruce Lee posters in the uh, in the closed down Great Star Theater when we got to go inside that. But let me toss it to Kathy, see if she knows of any one that she talked to that was involved in any way with any movies. Well, I know that um, Cynthia, I, I mean, um, uh, uh, Ms. Cecilia. Cecilia, yeah. She um, was a subject of a documentary that you can see on Netflix. So uh, it's called Soul of a Banquet. So that would be really worth watching. Uh, but she, I don't know if she's, I'm sure she's been interviewed so many times by CNN and many uh, news organizations, but we never met any actors per se during our our journey, but I want to say that Flower Drum Song really impacted me too because of the fact that it was an all Asian cast. And I remember when we were little, we hardly saw any Asians on television. And if we did, we tell the whole family to come to the TV. And by the time they came to TV, it's gone. <laughs> like, oh, we just walked across the street, it's over. So um, that was quite funny. Yeah. I, I guess one other that uh, we came, uh, we didn't photograph for the book, but who helped us on the book. Uh, is Ben Fong Torres. Uh, so he was not in a movie, but he was portrayed in a movie, the movie Almost Famous. He was the editor of Rolling Stone magazine for 20 years when it started up. Uh, so he's very well known for that. And, uh, and he was actually portrayed in that movie. Which um, I have not seen. Have you, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> That's our homework, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. I think um, we have, we'll try to answer more about also understanding that it's close to the hour. I did want to um, highlight one of the questions brought forward about um, China, San, uh, San Francisco Chinatown these days um, with the pandemic going on and like really impacting all of these communities. Um, it's a question about um, if you're aware, are most Chinatown restaurants doing takeout orders or like, are there, you know, in, if you've been able to continue staying in touch with, with your subjects in the book, like um, are there any ways to support uh, this community right now that you know of? Yeah, and maybe I could take this one because I'm looking at the next question and I know Kathy has a really good story behind the next question. So uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, most of the restaurants I think are doing takeout orders now. Uh, they're getting much more comfortable with it. Uh, they're getting better organized. Uh, the Chinese Culture Center, which is, was our uh, nonprofit partner in the project and to whom the benefits of the book sales go. Uh, so this was a nonprofit project that benefits the Chinese Culture Center. Uh, and they have used some of their budget uh, to help the restaurants get set up uh, and to be able to uh, uh, go online and have their menus online. Uh, so they've been helping the community in that regard. Uh, I've been there several times uh, since then. Uh, and now that the, uh, the traffic is slowly coming back, although of course we're in this awkward position where things have paused again in California. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the restaurants converted. Uh, it was not easy, but now they're much more used to it. They close Grant Avenue now on the weekends, uh, and they have, uh, you know, these seating areas out uh, in the, the parking area on Grant Avenue uh, that have taken over some of those parking spots. And so you can sit outside and eat as well as do takeout. And we've done takeout several times uh, uh, from China Live. Uh, Kathy and I actually had lunch 
outdoor seating at Mr. Jews. Uh, I've been to Dim Sum Corner a couple times because it's a great place to get something to take home. Really a good collection. Um, so yes, by all means, don't hesitate uh, if you're in the city or nearby to either stop by for uh, outdoor seating or for uh, ordering online and take out. Yeah, that's great. That's a great way to support. And thank you for reminding us that proceeds from this book also will support like Chinese Cultural Center. Um, and that's another form of, of supporting this community, I feel. Um, so the next question, what is the relationship like between Italian immigrants or residents of North Beach and residents of Chinatown? I think this is asking about like his, the historic relationship, if you're aware of that. Yeah, it was very tense. Um, early on when Chinatown was, was developed, um, as Dick alluded earlier, Chinese had to have their own community, they had to have their own hospitals, they had to have their own schools. You dare not go outside of Chinatown or you'll get beat up. And that is a true, uh, true answer because Norman Fong, who's pictured in one of our photos earlier, when he was a young man, uh, he challenged that notion and he went outside and he uh, was walking through uh, North Beach and some kids found him and they tied him to a chain link fence and they hurled water balloons at him and just left him there. So it was really a very hard thing to swallow for him. And many years later, what he did was he went up to the um, North Beach um, Chamber of Merchants and he told them what happened and they were so embarrassed and he said here's what we need to do we need to have a pasta and noodle cook-off and they had a festival where people would come and sample both types of cuisines chinese noodles and italian pasta and because he wanted to bring the communities that together and he said it was a great success so hopefully that that will continue that was a really good story yeah just connecting through food <laughs> you can't you can't stay yeah. angry when the food is delicious <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah that's that's a really great clue to like how we can um improve our relationships and stay mm -hmm. connected yeah. so um i i did want to just uh end with one final question um just to conclude our evening um uh, i was i wanted to raise the final question about um someone who was really interested in learning more about the SROs that you are mentioning and more about the stories behind your book. Um, they said it really reminded them of the tenements in New York City where uh, their family was a Jewish in immigrant family that lived there when they came over from Poland and Russia. So to just close this off, um, where can we go to learn more about this book or your projects or uh, San Francisco Chinatown? One uh, simple suggestion uh, is to go to the book website uh, we developed a website about nine months before the book ever came out. And the wonderful thing about a website, of course, you can start small and then add to it, which is hard to do with a book. <laughs> and a book has to be complete when you send it to the publisher. Uh, but we started a website. Uh, we have more images than are in the book by far. We also have more stories uh, in doing our interviews uh, as we mentioned, Kathy interviewed over 100 people. Uh, so there are, I think, 20 or 25 stories that talk about some particular aspect of Chinatown uh, that was discovered during the project. So it includes uh, one little section on SROs, but on Miss Chinatown, on um, the Green Street Marching Band, I think is in there. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, Lionhead Restore, so there's a number of side stories. Uh, you'll see if you go to the website, there's a tab that says um, stories. I think. And if you click on that, uh, you'll see there are 25 or so stories. And, and I think uh, some of those you'll find fascinating uh, in terms of going sort of uh, one level deeper. Uh, now, in terms of learning more about uh, SROs in particular, I'm sure uh, I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure the, uh, is it CDC's website, uh, Kathy? I'm sure. 
Yeah, CCDC. CCDCs, yeah. And um, the it's the Chinatown Community Development Center, and they own um, several SRO apartments um, in Chinatown. So they have many surveys and um, analyses in there that really go into great detail. So um, ccdc.org is worth looking up if you want detailed information about SROs in Chinatown. And in, in case uh, you missed it uh, on the screen now, the, the book website's listed there, uh, chinatownbooksf.com. So if you just go there, you'll find uh, a wealth of information on stories, more images, and also a more in-depth uh, history of Chinatown that uh, Kathy put together. All right, thank you so much. Um, with that, I would like to just wrap it up and really thank you to everyone who's um, attended tonight's uh, book talk with us. Um, I hope that uh, you learned something new about San Francisco Chinatown. And thank you so much, um, Kathy and Dick, for sharing your experiences on this project. Um, and I also wanted to thank Laura, who has been sharing, do, um, on, um, supervising our tech. So thank you so much to Laura for taking care of the screen sharing. That's that's really important work to make these things happen. So um, if you do have a chance to fill out our event survey, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, OACC is also currently um, going through our Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, so we would love to uh, have your support there as well. But again, thank you so much and we hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Akimi. Thanks, Laura.